for y'all. This is week number five of Love is Blind. It's the last Sunday of the series. And babe, I've been blown away. I've been blown away by how many people have sent us emails, direct messages. Even our social global family sent letters in talking about how blessed they've been by this series. Have y'all been blessed by this series? Come on. Getting better at relationships. We're calling it Love is Blind because love has this ability to make you oblivious to the obvious. Mm -hmm. And so we have learned that life and relationships are above our pay grade. We need the wisdom of God on our relationships. And we're trying to break this cycle that many of us get in where we get something we think we want and then we ask God to get us out of it. <laughs> now it's saying, God, show us through your word how we can be better in relationships. So I'm excited to tag team preach with you today, babe. It's going to be good. I'm a little confused right now because we're supposed to be preaching, but when I see you, it takes me out of the spirit. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Jesus. And then I got a band up here who oh, could even yeah. help me do a little song. I just almost want to oh. serenade you sometimes because come on, baby. Serenade me. I've been a really tired, baby. I'm there. All about these feelings. Not getting up. Let's preach the word. Yes, let's preach the word. <laughs> Thank you, worship team. That's what we're going to do today. <laughs> and uh, I, I want to be clear because this is what's interesting about today. So many people were telling me, man, I'm excited to hear you and PT talk, and we are going to share uh, just some perspective from our experiences. We are not marriage experts or relationship experts. I've said that throughout the series. We do have 11 years. In, yes. Uh, double digits. Yes. <laughs> but I want to be clear that I don't believe it's my assignment, our assignment, uh, to try to give you our opinions on relationships. That is not our assignment. You can scroll through the gram and see all kinds of people give you their opinions on relationships. It is our assignment to come to the Word of God. See, what does God say about relationships? That's the difference between following some blogger and what we're doing today, because we believe as a church that the Bible is the infallible, inerrant, inspired Word of God. So every Sunday, whether it's me standing up here preaching or PT preaching or us together in conversation, every time we gather on Sunday, we're coming around God's Word to see, God, what do you say about this? What do you say about this? So I want to set that foundation uh, for today. And we're going to look at a specific passage that speaks to husbands and wives, all the married people in the house. Let's pause for station identification. If you are married in the house, uh, can you give me a wave and make some noise? All the married people, all the married people. That's it. Come on, married people, make some noise. Come on. Yeah. Happily married, happily married, make noise. Happily Come on. Married. Frustrated and married? Just be quiet. Don't say nothing. If you're single, make some noise. All the single people, all the single people. Hey, whoa. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Single and waiting for the one. Okay, cool. Single and content. Beautiful. Okay. So I just I want to set I want to set I want to set up the stage and set up the trajectory of this conversation, this tag team preaching, to understand that whether you are married or not, although the specific scripture we're going to look at, Paul is talking about roles for husbands and wives. There is something that everybody can get out of this talk today. There's something that whether you are married, whether you are divorced and looking to get married again, whether you're single and content and you're cool, you still have some friendships. And I love it because before Paul starts defining what it is for a husband to be a husband and what it is for a wife to be a wife, he actually gives some relationship rules across the board, just across the board to have to deal with. Because here's the reality of every relationship and every marriage. You bring yourself to the relationship. I told you I should have called it a residue series instead of a relationship series because you bring the residue of you into the relationship. And I'm always, we are always trying to tell single people what you're doing right now, yes. you will bring into your, your marriage. marriage. Okay. I bring the context of who I am, how I saw marriage, how I saw fatherhood and motherhood. Yeah. We brought that together. As a matter of fact, let's just, let's just touch the ooh, August 24th. 2012 at the Majestic Theater, 
when we got married, how many know it wasn't just Robert and Taylor coming together? You know what else came together? 817 Clement Drive, Cedar Hill, Texas, 75104. My home address collided with. Oh, y'all, I forgot my address. <laughs> Eldorado, Arkansas. Eldorado, Arkansas. Three, 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 zero. Arkansas in the house. There's a few. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Those two worlds collided. Her household collided with my household. Her parents collided with my parents. And it's funny because, Lynn, we just, we're going we to be real today. Um, it's funny, the questions that we get often, one of the questions we, we get, obviously, is, ooh, how does that work? Black and white. Interracial question. And it, it's a fair question, but even that question comes with the reality of the history of this nation. So it doesn't necessarily really affect us. We're good, but there are some external factors from other people that comes from the history of this nation. And I say that to say that is the least of yeah. our challenges, black yeah. and white. I don't care blue and blue, purple and purple, white and white, green and green. When your family culture yeah. collides with somebody else's family culture, whoo, get ready for the fireworks. Get ready for it to collide. And that is going to happen irrespective of whether you marry in your race or outside of your race. I love to use this illustration. My parents are both black. Black. My dad is from Nigeria. Then God, dad, dad, please stand up. Please stand up. He's there. He's there. He's from Nigeria. <laughs> Pulled Eddie Murphy came to America and met his ebony queen mom. Where did mom That's leave you? Honey. Where's she at? No, no, she's out of town. I know I you're good. Leave. Okay. <laughs> but how many years of marriage, dad? How many years? Oh. 39 and a half yeah. years. 39 and a half years. It's amazing. But in the course, both of them black, but how many of you know? Completely different cultures. Completely. Nigerian culture is different from the culture that my mom grew up in Mount Pleasant, Texas, and it was the collision of those two cultures that caused friction. So I say that to say that before we even get to the, the role of husbands and wives, I just want to let you know that this is for everybody today. And the Apostle Paul obviously knows this because before he even gets into the role of husbands and wives, he gives at least five, at least five relational rules for everybody. And I want to look at some of those today. Uh, did you bring something to take notes with? Come on. Uh, the, the first thing, the first thing Paul talks about is that you got to be careful with your words. Careful with your words. This starts even in Ephesians chapter number four. He warns about coarse joking and be careful what you say. And how many you know, nothing will damage any relationship like the wrong words. This is inevitable. Mm -hmm. It is impossible for you to have a good, fruitful relationship and have horrible words. Your words will create the world and the relationship around you. Yeah. Every good relationship, hear me, it has good words. And it blows my mind that sometimes we think we can actually motivate our spouse or our friends with bad words. As if to say, you, 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 you are just terrible. I'm telling you, you have no motivation in life. You have no drive. I just, as if that's going to make the person get drive. Yeah. <laughs> as if our negative words are going to motivate them yeah. to become better. And how many of us have said words in relationships that we wish we could give back? Mm -hmm. But hear me, your words are powerful. And if you're ever going to have any type of fruitful, healthy relationship, friendship, you have to be careful with your words. Look at your neighbor and say, watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. Just because it came into your head doesn't mean you're supposed to say it. This is what, this is what even James talks about, being slow to speak. He goes, I love it in chapter four, he's even talking about like just coarse joking. It's amazing what we get away with in the name of, I was just joking. I was just kidding. It's amazing because we think it, we typed it that it's not hurtful. 
Well, I have to take social media breaks. I saw one comedian, he was talking about the reason he doesn't get on social media and doesn't have an account. He said it's absolutely insane. He said it's the equivalent of driving down the highway, letting a stranger come into your car, say the craziest thing to you at the stoplight, and then get out, and you got to keep driving down the road. <laughs> social media will do that. Even if you know what they're saying is not true, it's crazy how those words, you can get 50,000 good compliments, but it's the one compliment like, oh, I didn't like your jacket and them pants look too baggy and I'll be thinking about them. How dare you? Look at your, I can't even see your profile pic. You hating on my pants? <laughs> and so we have to watch our words. Yeah. Wouldn't you say that? That's one. Yeah, I think one of the, the greatest things that I've learned within marriage was often whenever, you know, your spouse frustrates you with doing something that you don't like, um, naturally is to nag, right? Especially us women, hey ladies. Uh, we naturally, our natural response is to nag and tell them why they're doing things wrong and how they can do it right. Um, but once again, that's nagging. And what does nagging do? It annoys, it makes our men withdraw. It makes them want to crawl in a hole and never listen to us again. So um, what I've learned is I take my nagging to the Holy Spirit. And taking my nagging to the Holy Spirit um, turns into trust. And it, um, I believe and I've learned that the Holy Spirit does a way better job at fixing my situation. Um, and I love it also because Often, whenever I think it's my husband, when I go to the Holy Spirit, I quickly learn it's actually me, and then he fixes me. You see what I'm saying? But the Holy Spirit does such a great job in communicating to each other, to our spouses, um, especially when you're sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And so you gotta communicate, but I would say, um, taking it to the Holy Spirit, he just does a beautiful job at fixing whatever we need to be fixed. It's so true. And when I think about words, especially, not to stay too long on this, but, Sometimes it's what you don't say in a moment that hurts. Mm -hmm. One of the things we had to work through in our relationship is when I'm mad and I got an issue, it is the silent treatment. I'm like, okay. <laughs> is something wrong? No. <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> and yeah. she, she's had to express over the years, like, do you know what that does to me when you get cold? I was like, what do you mean cold? Turn up the AC. It is not cold. <laughs> she's like, no, I feel it. I know what you're doing. You're withdrawing, you're pulling away. It's your lack of words. So men, sometimes one of the hardest things we gotta do is not go into the cave and not get silent and be like, well, <laughs> what I was feeling was, and even if it's a six syllables, try to get something out <laughs> because words matter, words matter. And so Paul just starts talking about the necessity to have the right words. One acronym that has helped me is think before you speak. Think and think stands for, is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Mm. Is it necessary? Is it kind? Is it true? Wow. Is it helpful? The other day, ooh, we gotta hurry. <laughs> Y'all want some real time stuff? Remember this week, we had an interesting occurrence. We took down our, our satellite oh, cable. <laughs> We, we, she called somebody to take down our little direct TV cable. She's like, this thing has been sitting on the side of the house. We have YouTube TV. We need to take this thing down. So I was in one him. of my little cleaning, you know, my cleaning things he talks about. Yes. So that's what was happening. He was like, you know, so I'm it's like. It's not needed. A I'm satellite thinking, on our, it it, we yeah, don't need I'm it. like, the satellite ain't bothering nobody. Like for what? Why do we need it on the side of the house, you know? <laughs> so it's on the side of the house. Somebody comes and they take down the satellite. This is fresh. This is real time. This oh my week. gosh. They take down, they take down the satellite guys. on Monday. And after they take it down, there's a cord still connecting, actually several cords, to which she said, can you just cut those cords? Oh my gosh. All of those cords that are on the side of the house. And the guy just did what she said, cut the cords. Oh. So later when I'm trying to log on the internet, Y'all, this is terrible. <laughs> devil started attacking on Monday. On Monday, I said, oh, devil, we know you're trying to attack us this week. This was Monday. All the internet gone in the house. I'm tired from Monday, and everything in me wanted to say, oh, was the satellite that big of a problem? I can't believe it. But I just went to bed <laughs> and laid down. <laughs> Because she's already feeling bad about the cords being cut. I had a breakdown, guys. <laughs> Let's not underestimate it. I had a breakdown. Is it helpful? Would it have been helpful for me to say, no, no, no. So watch your words. Number two, Paul, <laughs> move in. Says, Paul says you need to be quick to forgive. All throughout Ephesians 4 and 5, he talks about the danger of wrath, of bitterness, of unforgiveness. 
that can sit underneath the surface because you cannot let it go. All the single people, I told you a few things last week to look for. Can they give you the truth without crushing you? Can they receive criticism without being crushed? But another key I gave you was, can the person forgive without residual anger? Mm. It's one of the things to watch for, especially if you're not in relationship and not in covenant, haven't gotten married yet. I would watch for how quick they are to forgive. Paul warns about the danger of what bitterness mm. and unforgiveness will do in a relationship where you keep bringing it up and keep bringing it up and you can't let it yeah. go. Be quick to forgive. This is across the board. And then number three, be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. What does that look like? Well, we can see it in the Word of God. The fruit of the Spirit is what? It's love. It's joy. It's peace. It's patience. It's goodness. Kindness. Probably my favorite would be self-control. Um, but here's the deal with the fruit of the Spirit. It's not uh, you ask for it once and then you're good for the rest of your life. It is a, His mercies are new every morning. This is my daily bread. It's a daily invitation of Holy Spirit, I need you to come and fill me with your spirit mm. so that I can produce good, beautiful, and healthy fruit. Absolutely. And that's even the context of that verse. Uh, Paul is saying we have to continue to be filled. Yeah. He says be filled. It's not a one-time thing. For instance, can I get some more water uh, real quick? This is a perfect segue to this illustration. Oh, you're for real. He's for real, y'all. Right? No, I'm for real. I'm like, I'm oh, real. you can have my water. I'm for real because there we go. it's what I look at that. My oh. Lord. Oh. Because this was filled before, mm -hmm. but now I need some more. And that's essentially, I took all your water. Please. That's okay. <laughs> so that's essentially what Paul is saying. He's saying, hey, you have to continue to be filled with the Holy Spirit every single day yeah. growing in it. Because I'm, you know, especially with just number one and number two, whoo, to be careful with your words and to forgive. If you're trying to do that in your flesh, good luck. Good luck trying to do that in your own strength, in your own ability. So I love a right sandwich in the middle of being careful with our words and quick to forgive. Paul introduces the power of being filled with the Holy Spirit. How many know it is something about being filled with the Spirit? He actually does an illustration saying, don't be drunk with wine, be filled with the Spirit. In other words, the same way when you had too much to drink and it controls your behavior, let the Spirit do the yeah. same thing in you and control all all of your behavior and you cannot win in relationships if you just gonna function in your flesh Man. Paul says you need power you got to be filled with the Spirit and then number four be be thankful be thankful you you do this better than anybody else do I yes gratitude oh, that's so sweet um, I think I've heard someone say that gratitude uh, gratitude turns what we have into enough and I think the biggest thing is the enemy will get us to, uh, we'll, we'll be so blessed. We live our best lives and yet the enemy will get us to focus on the one thing that we don't have, lack. And so when we focus on the things that we have um, right in front of us, despite the frustrations within our relationship, despite the hardships, at the end of the day, um, I also heard that there's nothing that produces gratitude like loss. Um, I don't know about you, but for me, I don't wanna lose him and in return, then be grateful for him. I wanna be grateful for him every day because he is a gift and God has called him to me and, and me to him. And so yeah. gratitude, being thankful, it turns what we have into enough. Yeah. See, it's funny when they even study couples or anybody that's gone through grief or loss, it's amazing how the frustrating things become the things you actually miss. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're in that season, our kids are eight, seven and five, five yeah. pray for us. Mm -hmm. And anytime we talk to parents or even grandparents who've lost the kids, all of our annoyances are the things that they long for. Oh, to have a little laundry to wash again. Oh, to just hear the pattering of feet come down the stairs again. And we're like, please go upstairs and stay in your room. But it's amazing how when you lose something, then we get thankful for it. And I'm just curious in your own relationships, are you thankful? Wow. Or have you just gotten used to them? Because mm -hmm. there's something about the gratitude mm -hmm. that makes you value the relationship. Are you so occupied on what they're not doing, what they're not providing, that you're not even thankful for the things they do? Yeah. Provide? 
you, you mad because he don't got no six-figure job, not knowing he's doing everything he can. He's doing Uber Eats. Come on. You can't even appreciate that because it's like, well, let's not make him what Susie's husband is making. But at least the brother is trying. Are you thankful? So that's one. And then number five, ooh, again, this is across the board before we even get to husbands yeah. and wives. Mutual submission that Paul calls believers wow. to mutual submission. I think we should say that together. Say mutual. Mutual. Submission. Submission. Say it with your chest. Say mutual. Mutual. Submission. Submission. If you are a believer, Christ calls us to mutual submission in friendships and relationships. This is what nobody in our culture understands. Mutual, I, this is how I see it in my head. Mutual L, L, mutual L's. You both gotta take some L's. I told you this last week, some of y'all don't have the strength to be married because you can't take an L. Ooh. If you don't know how to take an L while you single, please don't get married. If you don't know how to just ooh, have the right argument and know what to say and have a PowerPoint presentation to give it, but you don't ever just go and just hold that in, I would suggest you don't get, if you always have to be right, how many, you can be right and be right by yourself. You can win an argument and lose a person. Wow. You can have the right thing to say and immediately crush a person's spirit. We've done it. We've seen it in, in relationships and marriages. You see it in relationships with parents to kids, where the parent is saying the right thing, but you're oblivious to the fact that the way in which you're saying it is crushing yeah. the spirit of your child. So Paul talks about mutual submission, that we as believers who are called to regard other people better than ourselves. Ooh, when was the last time wow. you regarded somebody better than you? When was the last time you said, you know what, I'm gonna let your need and your preference come before mine. This is what Jesus modeled for us. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but he came to serve. serve. And yet those of us who follow him are the first one to say, oh, do you know who I am? I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not believe. And we start twisting scriptures and think it gives us a right to be blessed and arrogant. <laughs> not knowing that it is a call to humility yeah. and to serve. So mutual submission. So all of that, if we ended right there, God bless you, it's been good. Come on, let's go, let's change. If we ended right there and you just did those five things, I would say that even if you don't, uh, even if you don't acquiesce to faith in Christ, if you just did that right there, good luck trying to do it without Christ. Yeah. But if you just did those things right there, your relationships would flourish. So Paul gives that groundwork before he talks about husbands and wives. So again, all my married people make some noise. Married people make noise, man. So I thought it would be cool if mm -hmm. now that we are getting to the specificity of the roles of husbands and wives that Paul gives us, I thought it'd be cool if you read the wives part and I'll read the husband's part. Okay. Yes, so verse 22. Four wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands. It doesn't say so you women submit to men. Great. It doesn't say girlfriends submit to your boyfriends. Great. Let me just back that thing up. It says, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. That right there is worth you coming. Somebody get God some praise for that. <laughs> Let me get free. Oh, hallelujah. Because the power of what you just said, babe, is imperative because a lot of people, especially if they don't acquiesce to our faith, they take this scripture yep. and they think that the Bible is suggesting and promulgating this idea that women are just to be subject to men and that men are somehow superior to women and that it could not be further from the truth. Paul is being very clear. 
saying, wives, submit to your husband. husband. Your husband. <laughs> so again, single ladies, make sure you pick somebody that you want to submit to. Submit to. Make sure the quality of their yes. decisions they're making right now are decisions that you say, yeah, I can roll with that. So great. So if right now he's like, man, nobody trying to go to Gillies today, girl. Let's go to the club. If that's the decisions he's making right now, yeah. what are the decisions going to be when you have little kids and it's time to go to church? So it's why I submit to your husbands. husbands. Yep. Ooh, that's that. That's good. Not girlfriends. Submit. What you say? Not girlfriends. Submit, submit to, to your your boyfriends. boyfriends. In other words, he better not be telling you to submit while y'all dating. He hasn't earned that right. If you ain't put a ring on the finger, she does not owe you submission. And a ring on the finger and you're at the altar, gotcha. literally, gotcha. yes, gotcha. being married. Because gotcha. you can have a ring on your finger for six years. Let's go. You know, see what I'm saying? A ring don't mean nothing until we're at the end of the, you see what I'm until saying? it's official. Yeah. <laughs> and it trips me out because the ladies get like two verses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's why I had her read it. Fellas, look at how many verses Paul about to give us. This dude gives us way more verses than he gives the ladies. I don't know it's because we need more explanation. I don't know what it is. But I got some serious issues with the Apostle Paul talking about how come they just get like two verses and we get like eight of them. He says, husband, love your, love your wives just, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. Yep. Cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Look at how Paul is going into detail. Paul knew that if he just told a dude, hey, love your wife, he'd be like, oh, I do. <laughs> I told her. <laughs> Paul knew us. He knew like, you got to make it plain. You got to, he look at all the descriptive detail. He said, hold on, homie, don't just love her. Love her as Christ yeah. loved the church and goes into blemishes and wrinkles and washing. He's given a whole picture to let, her, let us husbands know how we are to love, mm -hmm. how we are to love. He says, in the same way husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you should also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Ooh. Do you see why we get more verses, fellas? Because if we're honest, it's really on us. It's on us. When the enemy wants to attack a nation, he'll come after the man. When he wants to attack a family, he'll come after the man. If he can get the man, he'll get the wife and the kids. Yep. If he can attack the man, that man will shape what the son sees as a father and what the daughter sees in manhood. The weight is on us. So before you start using that verse like some man do to say, you, you better submit. Do you know what submission means? It means that I'm going to take the weight and the responsibility of being under man. Christ. This is an order of being under Christ and to let that weight sit on my shoulders. This is not about men being better than women or women being better than men. This is about roles. And Paul is saying, men, really the weight is on you. And he gives descriptive detail of how we are to love. I, if we were titled this message anything today, because some of y'all need a title, I would title this message today, Build to Last. Build to Last especially when it comes to a marriage. We want to build a relationship that will last, a marriage that will last. We got ready to do this set. Uh, they said, what, what do we want it to look like? And 
uh, Frank, our creative director, he's like, do you want two podiums? I was like, nah. He's like, do you want two bar stools? I was like, no, create a little living room scene. I said, get some furniture, make it dope. I said, go, go to Ikea. I said, because I got to watch our creative director. He'll be a restoration hardware. Try. <laughs> you said make it nice. <laughs> and I was thinking about that because I think a lot of people treat relationships like restoration hardware. You ever been to restoration hardware? Mm. Don't go. For Got a restaurant in it. It's beautiful. Oh my goodness, the furniture is amazing. It only costs 100000 for a couch, but it's a beautiful couch. And it looks all nice in RH, and they have it designed to the T. And you'll see this beautiful image, and all you got to do is come to an associate and say, I want this, 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 and this. And they will deliver that to your house in three weeks. White glove delivery, beautiful setup. I think that's how people think relationships are. Yeah. We see all these images. On Instagram, oh, look at them. Oh, relationship goals. Do you see what that relationship is built on? Don't get twisted on what, don't get caught up in what they posted. The post is not real. This is what trips me out about marriages that don't make it. It's not like they post the pictures of them fighting. Yeah. I ain't seen one couple, though, one marriage that didn't make it, that if you go to their Instagram page, it's pictures of them on there going, it's always the picture of oh, this is my boo, this the one. And I think our culture more than anybody is obsessed with projecting this image of health and projecting this image of everything going well when under the surface it's actually not. Mm -hmm. It's not restoration hardware. If you're going to have a great relationship, it takes work. You're going to have to build it. It is not RH, it's IKEA. Come on, Ikea, you got to go up in Ikea. You got to get it down from the box. You got to take it home. You got to open up that box. You got to look at them pictures that make no sense and try to figure out where does this go. Put it all together. That is relationship. If you don't get anything we say today, know that every good relationship will take work. It's not going to happen by magic or osmosis. You're going to have to put in some work and build it. It's Ikea, not our H. I wish it was RH, but man, it is Ikea. Do you remember when we first started building our house? I'll never forget it. We started building our house and went to this design studio. And as we were there in the design studio, I'll never forget it. We were just excited to be building a house. We were like, whoo, started from the bottom, now we're here. I never imagined we would ever get to build a house. And we were building our house, this is four years ago, five years ago. And we're building our home. And I'll never forget going to the design studio and they were asking us what we wanted. And we were like, uh, we like that faucet. She's like, I like it too. We're like, we like this, uh, this stain on the carpet or this, not on the carpet, this stain on the, on, the, on the concrete, boom, boom. And about halfway through, we had a bunch of decisions like that that we were just in sync. You like that? Great, I'll do it. You like that? Great, I'll do it. And by the end of it, I saw the lady's face looking at us like, what's wrong with y'all? I was like, what are you talking about? She's like, well, this is amazing. I said, what do you mean it's amazing? She's like, well, I've been doing this for years. She said, you, would see, you should see the fights we have had in this design studio between husbands and wives. I said, really? She said, yes. Yeah. Matter of fact, I said, if you can build a house together, you got a strong marriage. I said, are you for real? She said, we have had couples that have started out together building a house, and the house actually became the point of contention, and they got a divorce while they were building their dream home because there was no submission and nobody knew how to take an L. And isn't it crazy that the thing you sought out to build together could end up becoming the thing that would tear you apart? Wow. This is what the enemy would love. That those opposites that y'all had in each other in your marriage that drew you to him, ooh, she's so quiet. She was serious. <laughs> and now it's like, oh, she'll never say nothing. Literally. She ain't got no personality. She boring. And then, oh, he's so wonderful. Oh, he can talk. He's so charismatic. He light up a room. Oh, I just love the way. He's just so knowledgeable. He can talk about everything. And now you're in the marriage. He won't shut up. God, can you just for one second, but you don't know everything. Be quiet. <laughs> this is the trick of the enemy. He wants us to be torn apart. And look at Paul. He's writing to us today saying, I want you to build something that will last. But if you're going to build, you need a blueprint. And so he gives a blueprint to husbands and wives to say, hey, this is how you build. And what intrigues me is the blueprint that he gives. 
He doesn't go into roles as to who should take out the trash on Friday. He doesn't go into roles as to who should work or who should stay at home because those things can shift and change. He summarizes it, I, summarizes, I think, in verse 33. Look at it. These are roles. Verse 33 of Ephesians chapter 5. We got just verse, verse 33 up? Yeah. He says, however, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself. And the wife, here it is, must respect her husband. Paul is giving us profound wisdom in brevity. He said, rather than me going into all these details about the different roles, let me just give it to you in short form. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. Paul is bringing it down to two essential things. These are actually commands. Never in the text will Paul command the woman to love her husband. Mm -hmm. Because y'all just do that. It is in your nature. That's why when we have, y'all have babies, hallelujah. <laughs> it's way easier for y'all in that, I mean, y'all are already connected. We don't know what to do. He doesn't command her to love. He commands her to respect and commands him to love. Mm -hmm. So we talk about it, and it's a beautiful book called Love and Respect by Dr. Emerson that I want to suggest. And he talks about this crazy cycle that couples will go through. Yeah. That where the man feels disrespected, he withdraws the love. And then when he withdraws the love, she says, I feel unloved, so I'm not going to respect you. And then she doesn't respect him, and he withdraws some more, and he wants to keep you on this crazy cycle of never giving you the man, the respect you want, and the husband never giving the wife the love that she wants. Because how many of you know, if I am loving her as Christ loved the church, she has no problem respecting or submitting to me. And if she's respecting and submitting to me, I have no problem showing love. But the problem is, many of us spend our times looking at what the spouse has not given us instead of saying, let me do what I am supposed to do. This is the challenge that Paul said. Paul says, husbands, her submission is not your problem. And it shouldn't be your focus. Mm. Your focus is to love her as Christ loved the church. And her focus should be to respect you. And you will submit to a person you respect. Mm. But this is the friction in every relationship. What I mean, talk about, talk about the submission part, babe. Oh, wow, you're passing me the baton now. Yes, because you know how some ladies, some they heard some and they say, I still don't like nothing. Yeah. You're saying, uh-uh, he needs to respect me, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. That's what Aretha said, respect me. <laughs> 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 Which is true, but I think mm -hmm. Paul is so beautifully speaking to the differences between men and women. Rarely do you see a dude going, I just don't feel loved by my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some. <laughs> But most dudes, if you get down to it, it's like, I don't know if she respects me. Respects my wisdom. Respects my work. Respects my effort. Respects me even apart from my performance. That's the cry of most dudes. We've been saying this since we were little kids. You think I can jump off that train? Go there, little kid. You think I can do that? No, you can't. Watch me. Ooh. From the time, if any girl walks in the room, what do you think? Evie, Remy, my little one, as soon as they walk in, I know. They already have trained me to know what response they need. Daddy! <laughs> Whether it's their hair or their dress. It's, get close. Yeah. I want to be prized. Give me your attention. So we're, we're having conversations and we don't know what each other needs and we want the respect. Yeah. And so I talk about the, the challenge with the submit part. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about submission. I'm gonna talk to the ladies, but I'm also gonna talk to the men. Um, reality is, is it's hard. It's easier said than done. We read it in scripture and that's great, but now do, how do I apply it to my life? What is submission? Um, and what does it require? I think that um, when we were processing what we wanted to title this message, we had built to last. But built to last just leaves it at that. It's built and it's done. 
But then we changed it to build to last because it is a daily build. Uh, We are 11 years in this thing. And as he mentioned, we built our house six years ago and I'm still renovating and still have house projects on a weekly basis. And I believe that it gives us insight into what marriage looks like. It's, It's a never ending build. It's a constant figuring out, making adjustments, tearing down walls that aren't supposed to be there, removing mold that's not supposed to be there. You're constantly renovating and learning how to build. And so submission is actually not optional in our text. Um, Obviously, it's not forced, and and nothing is forced. We have a free will. However, it's not wives submit if your husband does what you want him to do. Um, uh, wives, uh, Wives submit to your husbands if they're faithful, if they tell you how beautiful you are. Go down the list. It's wives submit. So today I want to, in my 20 page of net, pages of notes that I have, I'm like, how do I narrow this down? But stay with me. Um, first things first, I wanna take a look at Jesus's behavior. Because Jesus is our model, not just for the men, but for the women, for everybody. But since we're talking about, hey, women, let's, you know, let's submit. Look at Jesus's behavior. Women follow Jesus everywhere. He was a magnet. Women were committed to Jesus. Women funded Christ's ministry. Women were the last ones at the foot of the cross. Women were the first ones at the tomb. And this stands out because of the way that culture was 2,000 years ago. Pre-Jesus, women were the lowest of the low. They were placed on on the level of a slave and a criminal. Men had the right to sell their wives into slavery or even send them off to be executed. Men could divorce and have and or as many wives as they wanted. Women weren't allowed to divorce unless your husband had leprosy. Women were non-existent. However, when Jesus comes on the scene and he makes his his appearance, everything changes. Jesus did everything contrary to culture. And we see multiple scenes throughout the Bible that reveals how Christ treated women. First, we see John 4, the woman at the well. Christ, culture said, run away from, don't go to, but yet Christ takes time out of his busy, clearly he's a busy man, he's got things he's gotta do. He wasn't supposed to go there, he wasn't supposed to talk to a Samaritan woman, a woman, a female, and yet he goes where he's not supposed to go and he sits and waits to have a conversation, eye to eye, to talk to this woman, which would eventually transform her life, which would then eventually transform a whole town, right? Jesus goes when no one else does. Jesus stayed when no one else stays. Next, well actually stay right there, Jesus pursued. Jesus is a pursuer. So I wanna to talk to the married and the singles right here. Come Jesus on. pursued. Yeah. Please husbands, never stop pursuing your wife. Just because you put a ring on her finger doesn't mean a year in you can stop. Let me tell you and brag on my husband, I'll never forget probably eight years in our marriage, I woke up one day and there was a sticky note on my mirror that said, you're so beautiful and I love you so much and I'm so honored to be your husband. He began to give me words of affirmation, which is one of my love languages, but that was a moment, that sticky note was not just a little sticky note, it was, it was a moment of pursuit. And Christ pursued, and also to the singles, listen, Christ pursued, men are supposed to pursue, okay? So if he's not pursuing you, he probably doesn't wanna be with you. And I know, and I know that's, that's hard to hear, okay? I know that's hard to hear. And here's the deal, guess what? There were seasons where we dated uh, for six years and there were seasons where he didn't pursue me. And guess what? He didn't want me then. He wasn't in the season where he wanted me and God had to work on me and my heart and build confidence in me that I'm enough. I don't need him to need me. I know what Christ says about me. Yeah. And listen, and by the end of the six years, I came to a place that said, hey, six years in, you probably don't wanna be with me. And I, I had enough security and confidence in who God said that I was, that whenever I, I showed him and revealed that side of me, that was attractive to him and he put a, three, uh, put a ring on my finger three months later. <laughs> so there you it's go. It's true. Yeah. It's true. The moment she was like, I'm done, bye. I was like, bye. <laughs> and two weeks later, I hadn't shaved. I'm eating ice cream. I'm like, no, hold up, hold up, hold up. <laughs> I'm tired of playing games, but it was an interesting moment in our dating season because as long as you make yourself just always available, hear me, ladies. <laughs> Fellas will go, well, she gonna be there. And so there is an order in which God did it where you have 
to be pursued. And that's the distinctive difference, I think, between guys and girls. Because girls, once they see the... I mean, y'all been playing marriage with dolls since you were young. We haven't. He's playing with Legos. <laughs> And so once a lady sees a guy, she's like, oh, he's the one. I already know what our kids are going to look like. It's a little bit different for guys. Because guys, we got to be in the season. Yes. Primarily, speaking in broad generalities, that we're actually ready to be married. If you are with a guy and he's not even in the season where he's ready to be married, you are wasting your time. But when a guy hits a switch, like, all right, I'm ready now. You need to be in his view. <laughs> This is how sometimes some girls are confused because like, wait a minute, I dated him forever and it didn't work. And I was like, how is he with her? And it was the season. And if you allow yourself to be played or allow yourself to always be available, sometimes it don't respond to the text. If he's treating you as just somebody who's there that's available, y'all, y'all are created to be pursued. But I also believe that within that proximity being the right person, that can cause also competition between other women. And that's not the case. You know, like you don't have to compete with another girl in the room. At the end of the day, I, will, I, I ain't gonna compete with another girl in the room. Do you hear me? That's what I'm not gonna do. Never gonna do that because I'm too good and I'm too confident and I'm too <laughs> And here's the deal. This is what I had to come to and it. realize. I said, you know what? Here's the deal. Six years in this thing, there's always going to be someone prettier than Taylor. There's always gonna be someone more talented and gifted than Taylor. I can go down the list of all the reasons why there's gonna be someone out there that's better in a lot of different areas, but there's only one Taylor, you hear me? And so if you wanna be with me, then put a ring on my finger. If you don't, then go find someone else. But because of what God, who God says that I am, I'm secure and confident. I'm not gonna compete with other girls. And I'm not gonna stay here forever. God graced me for that season and he was working on me while he was working on him. And so that's that. Let's keep it (laughs) Just so you know. But back to Jesus. It's not about us, right? It's about him. But this is what I love. We see Luke 8, the one with the issue of blood. The woman presses through the crowd um, and Jesus pauses and he turns around and he acknowledges her. He restores her dignity in that moment. The woman caught in adultery, thrown at the feet of Jesus and once again restoring her dignity, acknowledging her, looking at her eye to eye and speaking life over. Jesus' actions unlocked within the woman security, honor, adoration, and ultimate submission to follow and to serve him. His love is what unlocked submission. Yeah. So the Bible says that many women follow Jesus Many women to their everlasting honor. These women evidenced more courage and affectionate attachment to their Lord and Master than the disciples did. The disciples ran away, but the women stayed. Because when a woman is truly loved, her natural response will be submission. Come on. Okay? Yeah. So that is for the men. Women, you hear me, but now we're gonna focus on women. I'm gonna talk to you. What is submission and what does it require? and what submission is not. Number one for the note taker, submission is inevitable. We were all created to submit to something through God's system. So God has put a system in place and we're supposed to follow the system. First Corinthians 11:3, 3, Paul said, the head of every man is Christ, the head of every woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. My kids submit to Robert and I. Does that make us any more worthy than them? them any less worthy, or them any less valuable than we are. No, but they follow the order of God because it will save their life. We follow this system simply because it will save our marriages. The enemy will always attempt to distort the truth and seed confusion around a system that Christ has put into place. His system will always contradict God's system. So wives, we are submitted not because they're performing right, not because they're doing what we want them to do. We are submitted because we were first submitted to Christ. And God calls us to submit whether we like it or not. That is the law of God. That is the system of God. And so we submit. God has placed our husbands in this position and we honor them because this is God's system. Number two, submission requires willingness. It's not force, it's willing. Whether we feel like it or not, submitting to our husbands honors Christ. And because I love Christ, I willingly submit, I voluntarily come under the authority of my husband. The challenge with this, ladies, 
is when my willingness to submit is directly connected to his ability to meet my emotional needs. We often get trapped in this cycle, as you mentioned earlier, Pastor Robert, if he doesn't love, I won't submit. If she doesn't submit, I won't love. But I've come to tell you today, someone has to break the cycle. Yeah. Someone has to. It reminds me of my kids and their constant fighting over the other one is not sharing. I'm like, what is she, why is she freaking out right now? Why is she screaming? Because she won't share her shirt with her. Well, why won't you share? You have a shirt on, share the shirt because she doesn't share with me. And I always say, well, someone has to break the cycle because at the end of the day, if you're not sharing because she don't share, well, then you don't share because she don't share and then she don't share because you don't share. How selfish is that? But God is a generous God and we submit to Christ. And because Christ is generous, we are generous, right? And so here we are, it's not about your spouse. It's not about us. It's about submitting to the system of God, the word of God in which says we submit, we surrender because someone has to break the cycle. Will you be mature enough and lean into the spirit of God enough to where you can overcome and break the cycle? Number three, submission requires grace on grace, on grace, on grace, and then more grace. The call of God requires grace, daily, minute by minute grace, because marriage is a call, and you have to understand that just because it's the call of God doesn't mean it's easy, doesn't mean there won't be hardships, doesn't mean there won't be suffering. Paul Tripp, which I highly recommend his podcast, please write it down, Paul Tripp. He has powerful books on marriage and parenting and podcasts, but I was recently listening and I had to write this down because it was just what I believe that the world needs to hear. Marriage isn't meant to be comfortable. Marriage is meant to be transformative. If your eyes ever see and your ears ever hear the weaknesses and the failures of your spouse, it is never an accident or interruption. It is always grace. God loves the person you're married to. I know they hurt you. I know they disappointed you. I know they left you broken and wounded and insecure, but God loves the person that you're married to and he will reveal their need to you so that you can be a tool. Ooh, Holy Spirit. You can be a tool of his rescuing and transforming grace. You cannot have transformation without exposure taking place. So on your wedding day, when you're really in love and you're really happy and you really have no idea what you're stepping into, you gladly say, for better, for worse. Oh, for better, for worse. For richer, for poor. But then all of a sudden, living with someone, you begin to see their humanity. Yeah. And now you're all frazzled and you don't know what to do because their humanity directly impacts you. And now you're faced with what do I do with my spouse's humanity? Welcome to marriage. Welcome to marriage. And this requires a lot of grace. Yeah. You have anything to say about that? No, that's... You want me to keep going? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's powerful. I have two more points, so you can keep going or I can keep going. You, you, you go. Okay. <laughs> Take that. Are y'all with us? This is so good. Are y'all here? <laughs> Awake? Okay. Yeah. Thumbs up. We do, gotta, we do gotta hurry. Oh my gosh, I'm negative. Oh. <laughs> How'd I get there? I feel like I haven't been talking long, but maybe I have. Okay, I'm really for real gonna give y'all bullet points because I, I honestly feel like this is Holy Spirit. Just, he just, this is him speaking. It's not, it's not me. So number four, submission requires forgiveness. Where there's lack of submission, there's, there's a root of, of unforgiveness. He was unfaithful, the ultimate betrayal. He disappointed me. He failed me. He's cold towards me. Or maybe it's not even him. Maybe it's what your father did or what your father didn't do, and now you can't submit to a man because you have a distorted view of, of what a man should be and the role he should play in your life. But nothing will kill a marriage like unforgiveness. If you want to fight for your marriage, forgive your husband. If you want to fight for your marriage, forgive your wife. Forgiving someone who hurt you is one of the strongest things that you will ever do. It's not weakness. 
The enemy will say it's weakness and you're, you know, you're gonna stay and you're so weak. No, 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 no. Forgiveness is such a supernatural strength and power from the Holy Spirit. It's not natural, it's actually unnatural. I don't wanna forgive the person that hurt me, especially the person that I was supposed to trust. The, the person that was supposed to keep me safe. Wait, I'm supposed to, what, leave my family, get your name, and then I'm supposed to trust you and, and forgive you? But guess what? Once again, we submit first to the Holy Spirit. We first submit to Christ. And because he forgave me, because I'm not perfect, I must forgive others. So don't stay in your marriage and then complain the whole time and bring up the past over and over and over again, okay? That's not forgiveness. Now here's the deal, if you've done something that has failed your spouse and you may have to take it for a while, but here's the deal, if you wanna fight for your marriage, then forgive, okay? Next, submission is your husband's need. Sometimes I think we have a lack of understanding of our husband's needs, that he actually needs us. Uh, my kids are messy, demanding, at times they're often disobedient. I understand how much they need me and here's the deal, I continue to serve them despite what they give me. You, what, what do my kids give me? They give me drama, chaos, messy house, laundry, you know, all the things, sleepless nights. But guess what? I continue to serve them and I live my life in such a way to meet their needs, not according to their behavior, but regardless of their behavior. Mm, so Using motherhood as an example, we as women will sometimes treat our children, our sons as if they can do no wrong. But when it comes to our husbands, it seems they can't do anything right. We are naggy, negative, and we neglect their need of respect based off their performance. And that is not okay. Wow. Truth be told, they are someone's son. You know what's helped me love him? Is I, I look at Bubba and I think one day, he's not perfect and he's not gonna be perfect and I pray that his wife will be able to look in his eyes even when he fails and even when he messes up and calls out who he's created to be. Doesn't, doesn't, doesn't look at him and call him names and belittle him and use her words to destroy him but cause the life that is inside of him and the future and the hope that comes in knowing Jesus. And so that's how I view him. How would I want Bubba's wife to talk to him? Someone's son, your husband, your wife is someone's daughter. Y'all, yeah. I have so much, oh my yeah. gosh. I wanna I keep wanna going. Say, yeah, I, so good. So, so, you, gave me a, you gave me a revelation <sighs> of something you said because this was, this was healing for me. Because again, these build on top of each other. If I am doing everything in me to love her as Christ loved the church, it's natural for her to submit and come under that. Yeah. That, that word love that Paul uses is not an erotic love or even a friendship love. It is agape, which is a love that loves without expecting anything in return. Yeah that just goes there. And I love that you said that illustration because I'll never forget because you know, guys, we need help. You have to help us. And she'd be like, uh, I, just, I just need more, more physical touch and not just when you want something at night. And it just wasn't clicking for me. <laughs> and I'll never forget the day my oldest, Evie, woke up and she was on the couch and I did like I naturally do with my daughter. I said, oh, hey, baby girl, did you sleep so good? Like, daddy loves you. Oh, you look so pretty. And I'll give her a kiss. And I'm Never forget the Holy Spirit going, Taylor needs that. The same way you naturally go to Evie and tell her how beautiful she is and you don't think twice about giving her a hug and a kiss. That's my daughter. She needs that. And I'm telling you, this is the beauty of seeking God and having a spouse that is passionately pursuing God and y'all both are because the Holy Spirit will speak better things than you could ever speak. And it was a game changer for me. And I was like, you know what? Let me do it. It's not even in my nature to do the physical touch. But now, because I know, I know the benefits. Players, I'm telling you, you miss it out. Some re researchers say at least four hugs a day. Just now I really just, hey, babe, how are you? Agape love is a love that loves without anything in return. And it builds upon each other. We got so many notes, but I want y'all to see this. Do you want to say something else? You know, I have too much to say. We'll I want save you to it for, say I'll save it for another day. Because the message is built to last. And I think people are building wrong. Mm -hmm. Everything we're sharing today is talking about 
intimacy and connection with somebody. And I don't have time to go into all the details of it, but these are four levels of intimacy and how we connect with other people. And it matters how you build. There's physical intimacy, social intimacy, intellectual intimacy, and spiritual intimacy. Physical is the smallest box. It's the smallest box because it has the most boundaries. Mm. And it's the smallest box because it's the most limited. How I many know there's only so much intimacy you can have in physical intimacy? Uh -huh. There's only so long you can go <laughs> in physical intimacy. <laughs> this is important to the relationship, but you can't build on this. You cannot, but this is what everybody in our culture builds on. We build on all the hot, passionate, intimate connect. You can't build on that. Sex does not make a relationship. Sex makes babies. It does not make a relationship. So true. Yep. It's important, but everybody talks, oh, she's so fine. I hear guys talk about anatomy as if you're marrying that anatomy and not the character behind the anatomy. <laughs> this is important, but it is not the whole relationship. But so many people, oh, they're fine. Ooh, I'm going to build on the... Ooh, yeah, we just had hot, passionate sex, and we're connecting. This is what I've been saying the whole series. God created this. He designed it. Yes. He designed a context for yes. it. It's yes. not just toilet water. He actually has a place Come prepared on. for you, but people keep running to the toilet water just because they're thirsty. And God says, no, I have it. I love it. It's not gross. It's beautiful, but I created a context for it. So many people love to build on the physical intimacy and then on top of that they're like oh we already were passionate and we had great connection in the bedroom so now let's go to social intimacy and social intimacy is great but how many know it is limited to there's only so many trips you can go on there's only so many events you can go to horseback riding shooting arches and arrows all of that good stuff is fine but that's limited yeah and you can't build on that yeah because there's only so many places you can go and so many things you can do yeah but this is how our culture builds. Then, oh, you got intellectual intimacy. Yeah, this is how our culture builds. Start with the sex first, get the connection. How do they look? Oh, do y'all have time, fun together? And then intellectual intimacy. And whatever's going to drive this right here is what's at their core. What is their center? What do they think about men and women and relationships and raising kids? This is limited as well. Because how many of you know intellectual intimacy is limited by your spouse's or the person's IQ. So it's limited. I mean, some guy told me, he's like, I'm going I'm to I'm mess up the phrase. I think he said, a sapiosexual. I said, excuse me? <laughs> he said, I get sexually stimulated by intellect. I said, well, okay, that's great. Y'all just going to have conversations. I'm like, but that's limited. What if your spouse or the person you're looking for doesn't have the same IQ as you? So that's limited. But this is how culture builds. And then we've already been intimate. Oh, we got social intimacy. Oh, yeah, intellectual. And then, oh, then we try to pile on spirituality on top of it. So now it's like we've already been intimate. Wow. We've hung out. We've gone on trips together. Yep. I think I know what they think okay. about philosophy. But now let me just pile on going to church. And that's what we see all the time. Couples that have it in the wrong order. And now that everything's falling apart, now you want to say we ought to seek God. Now you want to come to the church. But this isn't the way God wanted you to build it. See, this is the biggest box. But how many you know this box really shouldn't have a size? Because when you want to talk about connecting in the spirit, yes. Yes. God is living limitless. Deep cries out to deep every single day in all of eternity. We will spend our whole lives getting to know who this God is, but yet we throw this on top and many people actually don't want God. They just want to fix the relationship. Jesus. Yeah. So they said, let's go to the series since they're talking about relationships and now you're trying to throw spirituality, but you started building on the wrong order. You started building the wrong way. So watch this. When life happens, when storms come, all of a sudden let go. This is what happens. And this is what's happening in the culture right now. People have built the wrong way, but this is what God wants to do in this nation and in your life. He wants people that will start by saying, God, I'm going to pursue you. Come on, give me two people that say I'm going to passionately pursue God and watch him start doing something powerful. It starts right here. God, I'm going to pursue you. And then after that, 
Once that's established, then once I know that this person is in love with Jesus and they're pursuing him, then I can start going for the intellectual. Because how many know when God starts changing your spirit, he'll start changing your mind. Your spirit will affect how you think about money, how you think about kids. He'll start transforming your mind. And then after that, then it gets social and you bring him to church and you start hanging out. But you got a strong foundation. And once you go from social, then you get married. And in the context of a marriage, that thing that is so intimate, that is like glue, that is not just two bodies coming together, but should only be the physical representation of every other place of intimacy. Then you put that on top. Watch this. Will this marriage, babe, come stand here with me. Will this marriage still be tested? You better believe it. Will this marriage still go through storms? You better. But will this marriage still have temptations and financial hardships? Yes. But the difference is you got a strong foundation. All these things are great, but it matters what you build on. So that means, guess what? When we're old and gray and I ain't got it going on and you ain't got it going on anymore and we got wrinkles in our face, we still going to be together because we didn't build on the physicality. We didn't build on that. How many know if we get broken, we can't go on the trip. I'm ride or die with you in an apartment. If we ain't got nothing but ramen noodles, I let it go to the Four Seasons, but I didn't build on that. So that can fade away. Intellectually, if you go through a season where maybe you're going through depression or postpartum or maybe something happens to me in my old age and I have Alzheimer's, she will still be right there with me if my intellectual capacity is gone because I didn't build on that. This is what you need right here. On Christ the solid rock, I stand all on the ground. Sinking sand. If you build on a strong foundation, you build it to last. And I know some of you, maybe you said, Pastor Robert, Pastor Taylor, I already messed up. I got so much baggage. And here's the beauty of God He's able to restore, He can give you a new heart. Does it mean you're going to have to work? Absolutely. But I'm telling you, if you would start with the spiritual, just say, God, I'm going to start seeking you. I'm going to start coming to church and getting plugged in in the word and start growing. And if you would just build it together, help me, babe. If you would just start with the right foundation. God said, I can restore the things that the enemies tried to take away.